Thanks, everybody, so much for joining me. This is Matthew Sweezy, and we are going today to talk about the future of marketing, really in 2016, and I really want to kind of make this a prediction, not necessarily a prediction, because you're going to have a lot of marketing people tell you, you know, here's the new channels, here's the new things you need to check out, here's where the hidden leads are, but really, I want, to, I want this time together to be talking about marketing fundamentals and, and the change in the roles and the trends that we need to be aware of. Uh, and really when we start this, I, I want you guys to understand that this is going to be based off of really trying to help us answer this following question. And we asked 5,000 B2B marketers, you know, what is the number one problem that you face? And really they all said how to keep up with the trends and drive more higher quality leads. And like I said, just following the, the, the little trends on channels and the changes to SEO, those things we have to know about. But I'm going to talk about something a little bit deeper, a little bit bigger. Um, and once again, you know, you'll be able to, to go through this presentation at your own leisure later on, but I'm going to kind of jump right into it and talk about one of the, the number one things that we must be aware of is this idea of trust and how important it is for us as marketers. Now, this is why I want you guys to think about this. First off, powerful moments. Every consumer has a mobile device, and each one of those mobile devices is so powerful, hence we end up with this term, the empowered consumer. But what I want us to really understand is it's not the empowered consumer that is going to be the problem we face in 2016 moving forward. Rather, it is what they have learned to do with that empowered device. Uh, and let me kind of break this down into one really simple word. It's called heuristics. Heuristic is, is the way that you self-teach yourself something. So if I was to ask you, has anybody ever taught you how to use Google, you would say no, yet you know how to use Google to find and, and essentially harness more computing power than all of NASA had in 1969 to land a man on the moon. You can, within a split second, understand if a website provides you with any value. And this heuristic behavior really boils down to a marker that we will not have a person for more than 1.7 pages on our website. Let me repeat that. The average amount of pages that a buyer or a consumer will visit on your website is 1.7. That is a heuristic behavior. That is not because your website is bad. That is because Google has taught them, if at first you don't succeed, go back to Google. So I want you guys to kind of think about that. This is the biggest problem that we are going to face moving forward in the future. It's not the empowered buyer. It's infinite noise. And I want you to think about this in one really simple way. The way that we get to a consumer is through what we call mediated channels. Every one of those mediated channels, whether it be Facebook, email, Twitter, uh, maybe it be display advertisement, those are all going to be managed by algorithms, and they're going to be devices. By 2020, there will be seven connected devices for every person on Earth. The problem is not that they want content and I have to create content because the empowered buyer wants content. The problem you're going to face is how do I even get my content in front of that empowered buyer because all of these different channels that they have are mediating that noise, and it's only going to allow the most relevant, most contextual things through. And that means we have to be relevant and contextual. The, the other thing I want you to think about is ad blocking. Ad blocking is not a big deal in the fact that it is a software. It is rather a big deal that it is being used. What we should realize is the fact that consumers are saying, hey, I hate your advertising so much, I'm going to go out of my way to install a technology to stop you from actually doing that. There is no do not call list for the Internet. Rather, there's ad blocking software. Now, this all comes back to helping us understand the psychology of marketing and really getting back to the idea of what we actually have to do. And Google says it quite simply. It is a path to purpose. People understand the power of the Internet so much and are finding their purpose by going on there and exploring. We must understand what that purpose is if we are to actually then break through and get to them with our messages. And here's the purpose. It's quite simply self-discovery. This is the highest form of value that the Internet provides. Mass discovery, or excuse me, mass publication is the lowest form of value. That's a quote from a guy named David Weinberger from Harvard. Now, let's talk about discovery. There's two aspects to discovery. There's active discovery. This is when you go and you search something out. Now, I want you to understand this. The top seven websites in the world are all discovery portals. That means you go and you ask a question to discover something. But that's not the whole story on discovery, right? There's also passive discovery. Passive discovery, think about the idea or the reason that you surf. 
in the first place, whether it's channel surf in front of a television or whether it's you surf the Internet. This is passive discovery. You are trying to find something. You don't know what you're looking for, but you'll know it when you find it. That's passive discovery. And if we can understand that those are the purposes, we can then really understand this new idea of trust. People will only trust things that they find on their own. And let me kind of give you the, the same uh, colloquialism that you've probably heard your entire life, right? You go to your boss and you tell them the idea, and they say, no, we don't care about that. Two weeks later, your boss comes back and he says, hey, I got this idea, and rephrases the exact thing you told them two weeks ago, and then, they, then you go do it, right? When, but when it's their idea, they trust it. When it's your idea, they don't trust it. Right, the same thing with a modern consumer. They believe when they find things on their own, they're highly trusted because they believe it was their own idea. You must learn how to leverage technology to help them believe they are discovering things on their own without you putting things in front of their face saying, bye, 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 bye. The next big thing we need to talk about are the changing roles of the chief marketing officer. Our roles and responsibility and scope are going to drastically change. They already have, but what you need to understand is that we really need to get back to being anthropologists and psychologists, right? This is a quote from Matt Lawson, Director of Performance Marketing from Google, and this is what I want you guys to take in. The switching economy, this means somebody moving from one product to the other, is valued at $1.7 trillion. If that was a country, if that amount was the gross domestic product of a country, that country would have the 10th largest economy in the world. Now, what this means is that people then moving from your technology to somebody else's technology is going to be another major factor that marketing must tackle with a greater fervor moving forward because it is a bigger problem. It is so much easier. And there's two metrics we're going to need to look at. If you're B2C, you're going to start need to measuring CSAT score, customer satisfaction score. This is going to be much more important than share of wallet, right? For B2B, we need to start measuring net promoter score. These are the things that help us retain customers. These are the underlying factors that keep them spending more money with us. If we optimize for share of wallet, we're just trying to get them to buy more. If we optimize for customer experience, they will buy more, right? That's the difference. Now, here's another thing. When we're doing these things, a lot of this is going to be marketing that's going to be real-time bidding. It's going to be uh, direct, you know, advertisements, which we're going to know who these people are, psychographic targeting. This is some very creepy things. And what we need to understand that privacy and protecting these things and protecting that privacy is our role. And, and here's some great research. If you show a retargeting advertisement after the purchase has been made, you are four times more likely to discourage further purchases. That is because you are no longer abiding by the privacy of that individual. You have now become a hindrance and an annoyance, right? One-third of current customers will stop doing business with you after a data breach. That is a marketing's problem to fix. If we don't take that on as our problem in the first place, we will be the one cleaning up the mess without the right tools. And here's a great way to look at trust. It is product times value times privacy. And I didn't come up with this quote. John did. And I was speaking with him at Data Marketing a couple weeks ago up in Toronto. So we need to understand that if we are going to do these things, we as a department on our own cannot do that. We are one department inside of a siloed organization. For me to make sure that everyone in this organization has a central mindset and always gives a positive experience and always understands the importance of trust and privacy, I, the CMO, have to have a greater scope inside the organization. And here's a great example. AT&T has seen this. Now, let's, let's be real honest. Telecommunications is probably the largest one affected by the switching economy. So it is no surprise that AT&T has gone ahead and taken a step and said, hey, we are going to hire somebody, and they are going to be the customer experience executive. Their job is a bridge builder to work between all silos to ensure a net positive experience and to make sure privacy and trust and a cohesive customer experience happens. That means that they are no longer just looked at as a siloed person in the marketing department. They now sit at the executive table and work across all departments and have the ability to then reach in and change things with oversight. Now, the CMO, their role is still going to be this idea of life cycle. And life cycle is going to come into something much greater than just life cycle inside of the marketing and sales channel. It is going to be the entire life cycle of every person we interact with. 
This means it's going to have to talk about interaction with our product, which means we're going to need to work with inside of that organization of product. It's going to have to work inside the life cycle of the customer. So whether it's the beginning and the end, everything is going to need to be orchestrated by the CMO. They're the ones that need to own the experience of the customer and work with all the other departments to ensure a cohesive customer experience happens. And, and here's the proof on why you need to do this. I'm going to let you research and read this up later, but I'm going to keep going. We're also then going to need to be able to validate with financial terms the importance of our role. Subjective ROI and other subjective measures that we use will not cut the butter in the future. Right. We need to understand this new concept of weighted pipeline, and the reason we need to do this is because sales has been showing value this way for years. If you go and ask a sales organization, they will tell you what their weighted pipeline is. The, and if you are a marketer and you sit inside of uh, meetings with the head of sales and the CEOs and the other executives, you will know about this because they are reporting this metric as one of their key metrics. This is how the organization predicts the revenue that will be coming in. We as marketers can do the same thing because we are the ones that are filling that pipeline for sales. So we need to be looking at a couple of things. We need to be looking at the total volume. We need to be looking at the velocity. And we need to be looking at the efficiency of how things move through our marketing funnel. Now, you're going to have to have underlying technology to do these things, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing I really want you guys to take into account in the, in the new year is the idea and the word branding. It, erase everything you know of branding, and the reason why is because this simple fact. We are all dreamers, right? But, but let's think about what we dreamed about when we were children. This is not what we dreamed about. I never said when I grew up, I want to create a sustainable, scalable, and valuable marketing program. No child ever said that. This is what every child wanted to be, right? We all wanted to be Don Draper. We all idolized David Ogilvy. I wanted to work on a brand. I wanted to make something sexy and cool. You know, I wanted to, to be a creative, right? That's what we all dreamed about. But that's not a reality anymore. We cannot just put pretty pictures out there and expect our brand to be a good brand, right? Here's a great example. This is a great example of a national retailer. They created this massively creative campaign that won tons of awards. But here's what happened. I saw this campaign, and it was to drive me to get me into a store. So I said, all right, how do I find a store? I go to Google and type in the name of the store to then find directions on how to get there. The first thing that Google greeted me with were consumer reviews with an average of a 2.9. I said, I am not going to that store. So now let me go to the website. I get to the website, and the website is broken, right? All of that fancy 1960 branding of, of having great creative completely did the job, but the cohesive experience left me with a net positive experience, meaning that I am never going to engage with this brand again. What is the only way that this company can get me back in its good graces that is to spend a crap to a ton much more money, and that is not scalable or sustainable or valued by our organization? If we are going to try to, to get our marketing messages heard, we need to understand this. Here's the actual math behind it. It's going to take 12 positive experiences to make up for one unresolved negative experience. How much money are 12 positive experiences going to cost you? Think about that. Right? Here's the solution. This was first proposed by Cindy Gallup, and she's one of the marketing mavens. I think uh, Ad Age Lister is one of the top 10 marketing professionals of all time. But anyways, this is a case study covered by Harvard Business Review, and this is something that me and Cindy have been working on together for the past, I think a year and a half, about this idea of action branding. And I want to show you how Levi's put this together. Levi's was going to release a new uh, line of workwear, and they said, all right, we want to get back to work. And they found this town called Braddock, Pennsylvania, and they decided they were going to help Braddock, Pennsylvania get back to work as well. And so what they did is they created all these advertisements, they went into the town, and here's what they did. They said, all right, we know that your town wants to get back to work. What we're going to do is we're going to give you $1 million to help you rebuild your downtown. We're going to hire only people from the city, and we're going to hire only people from the city to be in our advertisements. Every one of the people that you see in these advertisements on the right are actual citizens of Braddock, Pennsylvania. Now, here's what they also did. They then put advertisements in other local newspapers outside of Braddock to drive more business into Braddock. This is called action branding. Here's the formula. Shared value. They both value getting back to work. They took shared actions together, and they both shared in the profit. 
this is the modern branding formula that we need to understand because we can, via social networks and social media, do these very small actions. And this thing gets me into the next big thing for 2016. There is a new model for driving demand, right? And, and here's why I say we even need one in the first place. It's very simple. Forster Research estimates that on average, best in class, I want you to take a step back and remember, best in class, only convert 1.5 of every 100 leads into revenue. Average companies only create 0.7. That is a 99.3% failure rate for every lead that you generate. If you can't tell me that we don't need a better system for generating demand and revenue, then I don't know what number would ever tell you that. And here's it, it gets even worse. We're going to increase our budgets by 62% on digital spend, but not really doing a whole lot with it. And then Forrester even goes even further and says, by 2020, we expect that B2B salespeople won't even exist. So this brings up a big question. How do we then drive demand in the future when there aren't even B2B salespeople, those systems that we have don't work? And we really need to go back to this anthropological and psychological understanding of who we are targeting. And we are targeting these people called mediated people, mediated persons. This means on average they have 7.4 social channels and they have a different persona on each one of those different channels. Now, you guys probably aren't as nerdy as I am in the marketing thing, but I love reading textbooks. And this is a textbook that just came out this year called The Wiley Handbook of Psychology, Technology, and Society. And clearly stated inside this book, it says the following. Mediated relationships require frequent emphatic gestures. Now, I didn't know what the word emphatic meant, so I went and looked it up. It means small. It means very small gestures. Now, think about this. What is it like? What is a comment? What is a share? What is a retweet? All of those are frequent, emphatic gestures. And what does every one of those do? It breaks through the news feed and gets right to the notification screen on every person's mobile device. This, my friends, is the future. Now then the question is, who does these things? Well, let me break down the new demand model, and this is what it's going to look like for you. Your traditional marketing uh, practice is going to it, it take about 20% of your entire revenue cycle. 60% will be this digital rapport building and lead generation. That's your new demand. And then 20% will be sales. Now, this is the new middle, right? Currently, 80, that, that first 80% is all marketing. Well, they're going to be hybrid roles. These people in the middle are going to have a very different role. They're going to be much more like community managers than, than they are going to be salespeople or marketers. They're going to be very social savvy. They're going to be managing multiple channels. They're going to have a, a very completely different type of tool set. And what they're going to be doing are these things called micro actions. These are those small, static gestures. Now think about what these things are. All right, first off, they can't be blocked by ad blockers, right? They are reliable, they are free, and they get directly to the person and they allow for a personal brand engagement. Here's the best thing of all. It fulfills the person's purpose for even being social in the first place, right? You are helping fulfill the buyer's purposes of even being social by engaging with them that then also has a completely new type of brand. So branding as you used to know it is gone. Now, this also then brings up this new idea of content. What will content be in the future? Now, let's kind of break this down. Google, once again, I love quoting Google. They put a lot of money in this program called Think. If you're not familiar with it, I just introduced you to it. Please go check it out. Micro moments. And I want you to think about this. Right? There's this idea that we used to have that uh, we were multitaskers. And that there's been research that came out that says, you know what, this is completely insane. You cannot physically multitask. What you actually are doing is rapid switching. Your brain is rapidly switching between tasks. It's turning on and turning off, turning on and turning off, right? And we're so EDD, you could be literally doing something, an ad pop up, end up in a rabbit hole, start researching the cost of a new pair of shoes, find out you want shoelaces instead of shoes, and end up with a backpack because there was an ad on the sales site, right? There is no way that that can be a linear path. There is no way that we can create paths to do that. What we must understand is that consumers have extremely fast micro moments, and we must be contextual to those micro moments. So here's what Google suggests, three things. First off, for you to even be considered in these micro moments, you have to be there. Right, 90 percent of smartphone users are not absolutely certain of the brand they want to buy from when they begin looking for information online but they begin looking, they begin an active search, which then follows into a path of discovery. You can meet them on any of those channels, but as long as you realize 
that is what their initial thoughts are, you can then help them fulfill that purpose. The second is when you do engage, you must be useful. 73% of consumers say that regularly getting useful information from an advertiser is the most important attribute when selecting a brand. Be useful. Jay Bear wrote a whole book called Utility. If you haven't read that, I'd suggest it. All right, the next is be quick. You've got to be fast because when we have the power of the Internet that is so fast and the Internet speeds are so fast, we have heuristically been trained to expect speed. If you cannot produce that, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to bounce. We already showed you the statistic that you will only even stay on 1.7 pages. That is when it's fast. If your experiences aren't even fast, you don't even have a chance, right? Now, this all kind of brings up into question, how do you even do all these things, right? So you're going to have to have technology. Now, I do work for Salesforce.com and the principle of marketing insights. This is not a pitch for our software. This is a fundamental understanding of what it will take for you in the future to actually succeed at doing all of these things. And I'm going to further this by another point of research. You must understand that by 2017, that is going to be a year away in two months. That's not long at all, right? The CMO is going to have the largest IT budget in organizations. What does this mean? This means that Gartner expects that it's going to take you so much technology to execute on these things that the CMO will have more of an IT budget than your IT department, right? So let's kind of break this down. Here's what you're going to have to have at a basic level. You're going to have to have a connected journey across all of these touch points. That's going to allow these journeys to be fast. That's going to allow them to be contextual no matter where the engagement happens. And it's going to allow you to do things that are automatic that you just couldn't do before, which help you scale. Here's the four basic things that you have to have connected. Your CRM, marketing automation tool, website, and your product. Those things have to be connected for you to be able to be contextual at the level that your customers expect, right? Now, the next thing, all these systems are going to be running off of data. You must have a solid understanding on three types of core pieces of data, behavioral data. This is what people do on your own channels, right? If someone comes to your website and does something, they are telling you something very specific, and you need to be listening digitally and then understand how to respond to that appropriately. The second is psychographic. Psychographic are, is, the, is the new idea of a persona. Most people used to say, hey, I'm going to target people between the age range of 25 and 33 who are CMOs. I don't care about that. If you want to market to me, do you understand the power that is being provided to you by social channels and targeting right now? The, the level of ad psychographic targeting should blow your mind, and here's the reason why. It's because going back even five years, the biggest organizations may have only had even a few data scientists. They would spend millions and millions of dollars of aggregating consumer data, building these different target groups. And it may only be between with a small select set of data because data is expensive, manipulating it is very expensive. But now every social channel is in an arms race to create the best ad targeting platform possible, so you will spend money on there. What does this mean? This means it is now centralized. No longer do you have to worry about it. It's now free for you to use. You just give them your ad money. That's the best deal that you could ever imagine. Let me give you a hint of how powerful this is. You right now can go on Facebook and you can say, all right, I want to target ads. Let's say that we want to sell a crossover SUV. I can first off get the segment of people that are potentially going to buy a crossover SUV in the next 365 days. That data set is a combination of five other data sets that have been manipulated by data scientists that are in real time. It's insane. You can then say, all right, I also know that people like that crossover SUVs probably like family vacations. I want to add on top of that anyone that's taken a family vacation in the last six months. I want to add on top of that anyone that has a special type of credit card with a special type of balance that suggests they fit my so-and-so, they have enough money to buy my products. You can add and add and add. These things are insane. The level of targeting of psychographic data is ridiculous. The next is internal CRM data. This is why you have to have your website and your product connected, because you need to know exactly what that experience is. If your person is having a horrible experience with you, you do not want to put a brand that says, or an ad that says, buy more from me right now. You want to be able to suppress them from those types of advertising and do different types of messaging to them. You will not have that if your internal systems are not connected, right? Now, here's one other thing that this is going to bring about. 
you're going to see this role come about into the marketing sphere a whole lot faster uh, than you realize. The new idea is you're going to have to have a systems architect. I believe a lot of us call these things marketing operations professionals right now. But really, they're going to be systems architects. Systems architects used to be in the IT department. Their job was to connect servers and wires, manage load, manage balance, um, connect all of the infrastructure that makes our company run. What do we as the marketer now have? The largest IT infrastructure inside the business, hence we need our own systems architects that know how to connect the data, connect the technology, to do the things that we will have to be able to do. We need to realize that the level of sophistication of these tools, yes, they are going to be, and I'm using air quotes, you can't see it, easy to use. That does not mean no education required to use them, right? A lot of these have proprietary ways of doing things. There's a whole new way of connecting things. You're going to need to, to utilize APIs for, for very, you know, intense connections. We are going to have to have systems architects. And here's a really good case study. If you can get all of these things down, we're not talking about, you know, a 2% click-through rate. I'm not talking about, you know, a 300% increase in downloads. Those all sound great, but those are all vanity metrics. The only metric that your company cares about is revenue. And this is a great case study at how Diesel increased their revenue by 15% by understanding the core concepts that I've just outlined and by using predictive content. Right. This is kind of what we're talking about. Now, I'm going to kind of conclude this stuff. I know we went super fast and covered a lot of material, but really what I want you to understand is the future is completely different from what we've done in the past. Right, 2016, you need to be start realizing that this, the things that we just outlined, you've got to start taking steps forward to those goals. They may not happen in 2016 because these are major shifts and changes that you will have to do. You need to get the ball rolling on these changes in 2016, and hopefully you can instill the change in your environment and your organization to happen over the next couple of years. But these are major shifts, and they're going to take a long amount of time. But remember, the future only belongs to those who understand that it is possible, why it is possible, and how to execute on that possibility. And the focus is we need to have trusted relationships and valued experiences need to realize this old idea of advertising and branding no longer exists or functions correctly. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for joining me. Um, once again, this presentation, you guys can have it. Please share it. Please feel free to, to read more. Uh, and if you do want to continue the conversation with me, you can see my Twitter handles down there. It's uh, Miss Wheezy. That's uh, something that one of my friends likes to pick on me for. It's really M. Sweezy, but when you read it real fast. I look like I'm living with George on the east side moving on up. So anyway, thank you guys so much, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the day.